Welcome to the ACS Cricket Podcast. The ACS, or to give it its full name, uh, the Association of Cricket Statisticians and Historians, is a worldwide body. It's based in the UK. It's open to anyone who is interested in the facts or the figures or indeed the history of cricket or anyone who just loves the game. Uh, new members of the association are always welcome. Uh, we'll say more about what the association does and how you can join it at the end of this podcast. Uh, but at any time, if you'd like to find out more about the ACS and what it offers to all cricket lovers, please visit our website at acscricket.com. And now on with the show. I'm joined today by Marion Collin. Um, I'll spare you an introduction to Marion because we're actually going to be talking all about her life. So you should, <laughs> dear listener or viewer, get the drift pretty quickly. Marion, I'd like to start with your introduction to the game of cricket. I understand that you were among the lucky few and among women, the still luckier and fewer who got to play cricket at school. Yes, I did. I played from, well, from 11 really onwards um, at, at Sutton High School. And we were fortunate enough to have a number of schools in the area who played. So we were able to have fixtures with them. And we had actually some quite good staff, um, including um, an ex well, an Australian player who came over Marge Adam, who came and was at the school for two years and taught us to play cricket. And when I went over to Australia in 2009, she met us and gave us a tour of Melbourne. <laughs> so that was rather nice. Went and studied um, hotel catering and institutional management and got a job in school meals once I'd left, left college. Um, and then I got a job in a college which rather in, and had to work weekends, which rather interfered with cricket. So I, I, I packed that in and did another job. And in 1993, I decided I'd retire and do this offer to the ICC and the IWCC if I could collect all the records for the world and put them all together. After leaving school, you played a bit for the very storied Re Redoubtables Women's I Cricket did. Club. That is the oldest women's cricket club in England, uh, possibly the well, world. The oldest in the world, I think, yeah. now still in existence. It does still exist, although I think they only, they, they're only combined with Pearly, and they're called Pearly Redoubtables now, and I think they only have one eleven. Not that we, we had any more than one eleven before, uh, but they play on better grounds now than we did at the recreation ground, and uh, not such good grounds in those days. But I played, joined Redoubtables in 1961, having played hockey for Cheam and met somebody called Margaret Dickens who persuaded me to go along and play. There's there's a slight like tapping sound when you talk. Could you say a few words again for me? Yeah, okay. Uh, what's yeah. <laughs> it almost sounds like something's brushing against the microphone every time you talk. It's not fatal. We could always proceed, but... If there, are, if you see anything that might suddenly have caused that, I'm doing it on my iPad. Right. Okay. IPad you know what? It's it's not a big deal. It's uh, you're perfectly audible. Just you know, there are some some audio Nazis out there who, who right. might get a bit disagreeable about it. Redoubtables was founded in 1920, 20, 26, and is the oldest women's club in the world. Um, it didn't play throughout the war. Um, but uh, Ina Barraclough, who was one of our founder members, st stored all the test match scorecards from 1934 till just before the war, and she kept them in her loft till after the war, and then they were given to Margaret Dickens, who stored them and started to compile the records. And it's she and I who really started to compile the records. You went on to have a long playing career with Surrey and with Surrey Seconds. Um, as you're still close to the professional and semi-professional women's cricket scene today. Perhaps you'd like to draw out for viewers and listeners a few differences and similarities. Well, there is actually no county cricket for women at all. Uh, since the 100 came in, county cricket went. They do play age groups under 13, 14, uh, 16 and 17. I think they do play those games. And from those games, the, they make selections for the hundreds at the 100, the Rachel Hayho Trophy and the Charlotte Edwards Trophy, so I gather. And that's how they make the selections. And they as squads, in those squads, are trained and coached in those squads rather than having county cricket. They still hold, however, a 2020 county competition once a year during the summer. And that's all the county cricket there is. 
Well, that would be a major difference than uh, the Huge. retraction of the scene. Um, mm -hmm. Anything, anything else you, you've noticed that's different I today? Don't think it's played in schools. I think I, I spoke to Raf Nicholson last week before she went off to South Africa, and she was telling me that um, it's now very difficult. That there are not many clubs, and not of a very high standard. And I asked her what happens if a, a 20 or 23 year old wants to, wants to start playing cricket, how do they start? And she said only by joining a club. That's the only way they can get on the scene really. It's very much um, geared for junior cricket. And a bit about your own playing career for Surrey Seconds. Uh, you primarily played for Surrey Seconds, but you did yes, I, uh, fill, I, a, fill in a bit for Surrey First. Apparently you were a very fine fielder. I was, I was a very good fielder. I only fielded at point. And <laughs> well, that's that. where we stick all the good ones, isn't it? And I was just left to, oh, Chris Watmo used to say, stand where you like, you know, where you can feel. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, I enjoyed it there. And I used to open the batting and um, I was sort of second or third change bowler. I was sort of right on medium. And you say that in those early days, at least during your career, all games were sort of friendly declaration style matches. Yes, they were played on a Wednesday afternoon. We rarely played at weekends because obviously that interfered with club cricket and that was deemed to be more important. Uh, so we played on a Wednesday afternoon. Occasionally we went on a weekend away like up to the East Midlands and played in Birmingham and Bourneville and places like that. Other than that, we played local clubs and county teams, Essex, uh, Surrey, um, Sussex, etc. And moving on to your primary claim to fame today, your career as a, as a cricket statistician. Uh, it overlapped, in fact, with your playing career. Yeah, it did. So let's hear a bit about how that turn came about, the challenges you faced in the pre-digital age, uh, especially oh. given the really sparse material available on women's cricket back then. Certainly a pre-digital age. Uh, I started with Margaret Dickens just to do England, I and mean, she had the Test match score sheets. There were no one days, of course. There was a, there were any Test matches played up until 1973, and we kept those records in a loose leaf folder, uh, used Tipex, and used bits of sticky paper to cover over <laughs> cover over the records. That record book, and I do wish I'd kept it, is now at Lords. Also, during that time, I collected from people like Betty Snowball and Myrtle McLagan all their uh, photograph albums and scrapbooks, etc., etc., and stored those for many years until they were taken over by Carol Cornplate. Now they're all at Lords too. Um, in 1973, after the World Cup, the first One Day World Cup, um, I took over the records completely. And that's when I really decided that I would like to try and do the world. So I wrote round to various contacts I'd had or made during the 1973 World Cup, and they sent me score sheets. And from that, I compiled the original um, statistics. And I used a Gordon Vince's statistical package, which I still have, actually. I'm a cricket statistician. I, I do it for a broadcast in South Africa. And really, I, I barely feel entitled to the title, as it were, when I, <laughs> when I consider the, the challenges you had. I just riff on pre-existing databases, all up on Stats Guru, whereas you, kind of like Arthur Haygarth, um, back in the day, uh, you had to compile the, the database yourself I from scratch, did you not? I, I compiled them from scratch from the score sheets I was sent, not always accurately completed, in fact, some very inaccurately <sighs> completed, uh, especially, uh, and had an awful job to get them from India. There was a little guy who helped me called Tariq Ali, and he used to get newspaper cuttings for me, and he lived under a, under a tree. And I think under a that's tree. how he lived, and he used to send me all these uh, newspaper cuttings. And from that, we compiled the score sheets. Wow, uh, fascinating stuff. I'm I'm always interested in in the the genesis of these things that we all so take for granted today. Uh, you were appointed honorary statistician to the International Women's Cricket Council. Yeah, when I retired, I gave up work in 1993 and decided that's what I'd do. And I wrote to them and said, could I do this? And they said, yes. And that's when I got the first statistics program, actually. But again, I had to put obviously all the statistics on from the score sheets manually.
IWCC uh, no longer exists. It merged no. with the ICC in 2005, I believe. Yeah, right. And yes, yes. you basically retained your position with that merger. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I did. And then I, I, from then I got paid an annual fee for doing it and they paid for all my, um, you know, uh, internet time and that kind of thing and paper and all those kind of things they paid for me. Would that but make now, you the first professional woman's cricket statistician? I would think so, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine so. Very well done. And I used to sit at all the matches because, you know, you couldn't access the information like you can now on Crick Info and Cricket Archive. Uh, you couldn't access it like that. And so I used to sit there in the press room and give them all the information. And I did that right up until the, well, the, nine, the 2000 and 17 World Cup, really. We've discussed your playing career, your scoring and statistical career. We haven't yet touched on the fact that you have several international caps as an umpire. I wonder if you'd uh, share some not, reminiscences. Not or... international caps as an umpire, certainly as a scorer. I scored in three test matches and many, many in one-day internationals. Um, I umpired at county level, really, not my okay. seat. Didn't really like umpiring. Um, once the county championship moved to Cambridge, I umpired for several years there. Then I scored for Berkshire. Why didn't you like umpiring? Were the, were the players a bit mouthy? No, no, they weren't. I just don't think I was very quick. <laughs> oh, I see. You, you like to mull over your decisions. Uh, yes, I don't okay. think I was the best, really. Although I qualified as an umpire. And do you have any reminiscences of your time as an umpire? Any interesting I stories to share? Have one as a, a scorer. We scored a match against India at Collingham, Joan Hodges and I. And in the penultimate hour, India only bowled eight overs. And I think both of us actually went to sleep. <laughs> and, and after that game, they did bring in the stipulation of how many overs in a day should be bowled. They lost us the match. We should have won it. But there was sun on the windscreens. There was all sorts of excuses. They had one player going from fine leg to fine leg with a left and right hander. And they were as slow as they could be. And they actually bowled only eight overs in the penultimate hour. Oh, wow. Okay. Puts into perspective our complaints about over rates uh, in the oh, international absolutely. men's game. <laughs> absolutely. And it was it was painful, really. And you know we didn't have uh, we didn't have any cooperation really from from players. Uh, they were the, the I won't say the Indians were quite difficult. They're not now, but they were then. Okay, all right. Are you following the T Twenty Women's World Cup very closely? Oh yes, I've managed to get four matches on my database. This okay. Um, I import them all now from Crick, Crick Info directly from Crick Info. And I then print them off and check them with Cricket Archive. Is there anything very interesting that uh, you'd advise the statistically curious amongst us to look out for as we're consuming this you tournament? You have to be very accurate and have a good memory, I think. I see. In fact, I can almost remember all the, well, two or 3,000 players that are on my database. And I can remember whether they're there or not. The problem is, very often, they play under different names especially Sri Lankans, they have several names they use. And one match they'll have, or one series, they'll have one name on their shirts and another series they have another name. And I tend, I do a lot of work on Cricket Archive combining players. Um, in the days when they didn't have to give dates of birth, it was much more difficult. But now with the date of birth and places right, of birth, right. it, and last week I, I combined or oh, several players, especially from new teams that play like Cambodia, who've just started. It was an absolute nightmare. And the first set of score sheets from them, I've got to query it with the ICC, were really very inaccurate. Um, and I put them on, but they're certainly not right. They don't balance at all. Yeah, OK. Um, what does one do in those situations? Well, uh, when, Ho when I knew Holly Colvin, of course, when she was char in charge of IWCC women, and she used to chase it up for me. I don't think with this particular series we're going to do very much, be able to do very much at all. Oh um, they've played Singapore and in the last week or so, and that's been okay. But the first series, I think they don't, I don't know whether perhaps they use c the computer. I really don't know. But when they come on as a new team, it really is quite difficult. It's a harder task than people give it credit for, isn't it? It 
takes me hours. I do it for well, nearly every day. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean the scoring itself. You know, people people new itself. to it uh, don't don't always appreciate how time consuming and and concentration intensive it's it is. Concentration, I think. And if people took, I found it very difficult when people talked around you. Or right. when they came to in the middle of a game and said, "Oh, isn't so and so getting near a fifty? Well, how many? Oh, you know what she yeah, How many yeah. horses?" And you think, "Oh, I can't tell you that." That's the real challenge when you're doing and it for radio weird. or television. You yes, have to I'm answer sure. queries at the same yes, time as yes, you're you you're keeping the score. So, uh, yeah. Who do you fancy for this World Cup? Surely you you must have an idea. I mean, everyone uh, fancies Australia, of course. So I think I'll, I'll say you're not allowed to say Australia. Which which team should we look out for? England, India, or Australia? England, India, Australia. Mm. Were you as astonished as the rest of us by South Africa's triumph against uh, New Zealand the other day? Yes, but I'm New Zealand, really, and they are not really doing terribly well, and I don't quite know why. I mean, they don't appear to have lost anybody. No, they're, all the big names are still there, aren't they? Yes, they are. Um, and they've lost both their games. And they was, lost the warm-up game, too, quite badly. Uh, you know, I don't know why. And and who among the the, the lesser sides would you uh, pinpoint as a dark horse to go deep in this competition? I think Sri Lanka could. If, if Atapatu can stay in batting, I think right. they're a dark horse. The West um, Indies aren't in a good place at the moment either. No, they're having a bit of a post dotton hangover, aren't they? Well, and I think this is going to be the trouble. They're going to pull out from paying for international cricket where, with the w, uh, the WIPL, the Big Bash, and the 100. You know, they get paid considerable sums. They're not going to bother to play for countries, their country. No, and that's an increasing worry in the men's game too and That's indeed in the South African women's game we've had a, yep. a few players uh, give yes. up on being asked to meet certain fitness requirements and right. decide and instead it, that they'll go perambulating the franchise it, world they need them in the team I mean okay they perhaps they weren't the fastest but they could certainly hit the ball and they should I'm, I'm not sure quite how I feel about that a, a couple of the players in question have alleged that they were being discriminated against for their appearance and i I'd, I'd suggest that there's a difference between fitness and appearance you you could theoretically oh, so, weigh over 100 kilograms and still be very fit couldn't you exactly i mean deandra dotting's quite a big player you know she's but she could hit the ball and she's fallen out and i think there's another player in west indies who's fallen out with the authorities so to speak um and but they can earn enough money by playing in these competitions. But you've got to get there and get noticed, of course. Right. Uh, and that's where I think the, the lesser countries will progress in a way. If there's, I, I don't know, that they can't get known so well. No, like quite. Singapore and China and And Uganda, um, Thailand and Brazil. I believe both those two countries uh, professionalized their women's game before yes, they professionalized they their men, didn't they? They did. Brazil have, yes, and uh, yep, they have Thailand. Thailand are not bad at all. No, from what I've they're heard, they're, they're half decent. Uh, in fact, they have a better record in recent years than the aforementioned West Indies, don't they? Yes, they have. Yeah, they have. No, Thailand are really quite good. Now, I think it's 55 countries playing um, official 2020 cricket. And uh, just to backtrack a moment, uh, we were talking about... Um, uh, modern fitness in the women's game. Uh, how do you think it compares to your day? I mean, you, you'd think superficially that what with it having been professionalized, uh, the modern player might be a good deal fitter. But of course, most of them are only playing 20 overs nowadays rather than a whole day. The cricket you played being decoration cricket. W where do you stand on that? They're Is the modern player fitter, fitter than you were? They're far fitter than me. Really? Are. Okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, they train far harder, of course. We had what and that, two evenings a week training and that was in our you know in our own time if you like um, and you had to have somebody to lead that training um because it could be a bit of a waste of time uh otherwise but it would they're far far fitter and i suppose you, you you'd say that that extends to the women's game more broadly that the standard of it i mean you reckon yes, it's it, come a long way in recent times absolutely okay any contemporaries of yours, though, who you think would have would have been really great nowadays, who who were just born at the wrong time? Jeanette Britton would have still been a great player. She was the greatest player I have ever seen. 
first of all, we used to hold nets up in Morden Hall on a bank holiday Monday. And she came along at 10 years old, 10, 11, with her grandfather. And I've never seen anything like it. And she just went in the net and she started batting. And we said, you'll play for England. And play for England she did, of course. She was our greatest test player. She was just determined to beat Rachel's record, which she did. <laughs> of course, she died at the age of 58, cancer. And any players from that era who you think sort of missed out on the kind of recognition she enjoyed purely by virtue of the fact that it wasn't the viable career path it is today? Yeah, I think there were quite a lot. Um, probably Jan Southgate, who captained England, and Rachel, of course, in a way made her made her way uh, by playing in all sorts of celebration matches and things like that. Um, yes, I think there were quite a number of people who who could have, in today's era, would have been great players. You're, you're too modest to say that you yourself might have... Uh... Oh, no, not me. I would have only played for Surrey Second Eleven. <laughs> Oh, I, I believe you had quite a good record. I think you're you're doing yourself down when you say you were only in it for your fielding. Well, I I was a good fielder. Okay, all right. Well, thanks so much. Is is there anything else you you were wanting to cover? Anything I haven't asked you that you'd you'd I, I like to tell the world about? I I mean I still do a lot with Pete. Uh, well, I put on a lot of information on his site now. Is that Pete uh, Griffiths? Yes, Pete yeah. Griffiths. I do a lot with him. And he, of course, has been absolutely super in putting score sheets on and um, and putting all our information we have. I don't know where he finds the energy. <laughs> no, neither do I. I mean, our minute books from our club and uh, the county are all on. And I mean, it's an amazing record. Oh, yeah, we, we should direct people to that. That's the crickethistory.web website, <laughs> I believe. Yes. Yeah. Let me type it into my browser and make sure I'm giving I, the correct cricket address. Is, cricket history, it is. Cricket history website. That's the one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you'll find all sorts of original material, um, lot, painstakingly digitized. Yes, there's a lot of photographs on there, which have mostly come from me or from Netta Rheinbeck or, or people's records. He went through all their scrapbooks and things and scanned in photographs. A, a great resource for anyone looking hmm. to to research um, this rather understudied branch of our noble game. Raphael Nicholson, she's written a book on women's cricket, the history of women's cricket, uh, and she's it's really very good. And she's in South Africa and she's a, really a blogger and she runs the Cricket Her, which is cricket and H-E-R on the end. Oh, here we go. It's called Ladies and Lords, A History of Women's Cricket, published three years ago, four years ago now, how yeah, the time yeah. flies. No, okay. it's very good. And she did an awful lot of research and did an awful lot of interviews with people like Enid Bakewell and Rachel before she died. And, and it's, it's a very good book. I, I have actually read it from cover to cover because <laughs> I could remember quite a few of the people and uh, incidences in it. Well, it's very much on my to read list now, too. It is. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Marion. Um, Whereabouts are you based? I'm based in South Africa myself. Oh, I'm hoping to get to a few of these World Cup games if I can spare the time. I think yeah. they should be well worth well worth going to. They've been fairly well attended so far too. I was a, I was a bit anxious about them following so close in the heels of that big T20 tournament. What, as the if they no uh, the the South African SA20. Oh, that um, oh, right. men's yeah. I thought oh <laughs> having that follow so soon upon it, it might be a bit after the Lord Mayor's show, but it's yeah uh, the South African games at least, which are the ones I've been watching owing to you know national allegiances. They've been very well attended, almost mm -hmm. sellouts from what I can tell, and attracting a very different sort of audience. So that's been most gratifying that's... to see. I'm not wild about T20 as a rule. But I I do enjoy the the women's game a little I mean, less I... a little less you know clearing the front leg and and swiping and yes. perhaps a, a bit more subtlety to it you know mm. rather like women's tennis as compared to men's tennis more more I of think... a touch game I think yes yeah I mean I prefer one days and test matches to twenty twenty but <laughs> oh yeah for sure for sure absolutely I think but. The yeah. market is what it is, unfortunately. The market's what it is. It's what it address, uh, you know, attracts the the uh, the crowds, isn't it? Indeed. Like the hundred and the. Uh... All right, Marion. Thanks so okay. much. Thanks very much. It's right been a hope. pleasure.
Cheers. So this podcast has been prepared on behalf of the Association of Cricket Statisticians and Historians, but the views expressed by the participants are not necessarily shared by the ACS as a whole or by its individual members. ACS celebrates its 50th birthday this year. In that time, it has led the way in establishing a definitive list of first-class matches to act as a baseline for all statisticians, as well as carrying out detailed research into a huge range of subjects relating to the history and statistics of the game. The association has also published over 500 books on the facts, figures and personalities of cricket. In addition, on our website, you'll can find what we believe to be the most complete and up-to-date listing of records of both men's and women's cricket in all formats of the game. And there's much more besides. So why not take a look at acscricket.com for yourself? The website also tells you how you can join the association. If you'd like to do so, it's very straightforward. We look forward to welcoming new members wherever you live and whatever your level of interest or involvement in the great game of cricket. And we would welcome your questions or feedback on matters from today's podcast. Meanwhile, don't forget to listen out to our next podcast coming soon.